Thank you. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, it's consulting engagements, royalties, stock and equity, paid speaking, um, Surgeon Advisory Board. I'm an anti-communist, so I enjoy my experience working with industry. I think that's where all the uh, great things happen with regard to human progress in the private sector. Most specifically, um, I'm a paid speaker and consultant surgeon advisor for uh, Convitec, who's a couple of products I'm going to talk about in this talk. So many authors consider uh, infection to be the most common cause of failure of hip and knee arthroplasty. I know we've talked about instability being a, a common cause in terms of other studies. But we see a prevalence of up to 2.2%, which is staggering. And Kurtz has indicated that this is on the rise. It's not going down. It's, it's going up exponentially. What's the patho pathogenesis? I think it comes either from direct inoculation at the time of surgery or shortly thereafter when the skin incision is not sealed. There could be a continuous, spreadness, a continuous spread from adjacent focus, like a surgical site infection or a local cellulitis, or hematogenous spread. I think there's host factors, pathogen factors, and outside environmental factors, and some of which can be modified and mitigated. The clinical impact is severe, leading cause of morbidity following joint replacement with an up to 18% mortality. Some of these patients went in for a traditional, just an easy total hip, and then uh, they can end up dead just from an infection. Statistically increased the rate of revision surgery, and it's much more expensive, up to four times the cost of a primary, 50,000 per infection, 60,000 more than an aseptic counterpart. So what are the goals? Dr. Patsakis was my uh, mentor and chairman uh, at, at USCLA County and taught us uh, infection from day one. Um, there's four goals, and I know we have some residents uh, that worked with us in the audience, and I'm sure they have PTSD right now because they know I hammer this in all the time, but I'm going to do it again. Thorough and, uh, and complete debridement of all infected and devitalized bone and soft tissue, maintenance of mechanical stability, delivery of the appropriate antibiotic locally and systemically, and preservation of that soft tissue envelope. If I get a, a bone or joint infection that hasn't cured, um, usually one or more of those things hasn't been addressed. Now, why I say this? Because when we know how to treat something, I think that's the best way to prevent it. So uh, perioperative goals of PI, PJI inf infection prevention include optimizing the systemic host immune and healing potential, eradicating potential sources of spread, minimizing the local contamination, and optimizing the local soft tissue envelope. So today I'm going to talk more about how to optimize the local area both before, during, and after surgery. The international consensus for PGI was put together by Gerke and, and Parvizi. We got together with 400 experts from 58 countries, uh, over 100 established medical societies, predominantly our own MSIS here in America, combined with the European Bone and Joint Infection Society. And their goal was to look at the relative literature, about 3,500 articles, and come up with some degree of consensus regarding um, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of PGI. Here are some of the things they looked at, and specifically they did look at wound management. They did things, how do we optimize prior to operation? They recommended that correction of malnutrition, anticoagulation, anemia, and diabetes were essential before going into surgery. What's the preoperative uh, aseptic uh, protocol? They did agree that chlorhexidine gluconate, CHD, unless they're allergic, should be used at least the night prior with a CHD bath, and the patient should sleep with clean bed sheets the night before. Um, in the perioperative period, specifically when we're in surgery, I think it's important, and, and Dr. Matta uh, uh, touched on this earlier, I, I believe that we are just as much soft tissue surgeons as we are bone surgeons, and we tend to just focus on the bone. Um, here we show some of the angiosomes, and if you look at the proximal thigh, um, femoral artery covers the, the anterior portion, and the lateral femoral circumflex covers the lateral. Remember, most of us choose to sacrifice the lateral femoral circumflex. I mean, you're taking away that main source artery and you're just relying on local feeders. Those come from the fascia. When you strip the fascia and elevate the fascia, that's when you get into trouble. So this, this is the way I like to do my uh, incisions. This is more of a Hoiter modification where we make our incision directly over the TFL and size the TFL fascia. So we're not going through the TFL, obviously, but I'm elevating it off medially and developing that medial interval. That also helps you avoid the uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which tends to run in the sartorial sheath. Uh, I, I'd like to think that we have pretty good uh, low incidence of, of thigh numbness after surgery. Anytime I see the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, I know the patient's going to have symptoms and complain about post-op. So I don't see it because I stay in the TFL sheath and I stay away from it. You want to avoid excessive retraction. That, that incision there is about as small as I can make it in my hands, about seven centimeters. You can see it's starting to curl a little bit because you're pushing at the, towards the ends. Um, you maintain those full thickness flaps. Uh, in the old days, we used to use the... Uh, the Alexis, uh, the protractor and elevate off of the fascia. And I think that's a big no-no for the reason why I described, uh, decreasing the, the blood supply to the incision right where you need it most. 
um, pr pr try to avoid prolonged operative time, liberal irrigation, TXA to minimize big hematoma formation, multi-layered wound closures. I like uh, closing the capsule because I think that's another layer of protection and, and tamponade for bleeding. And post-op, I think ASA instead of uh, Lovenox is, is much better. So the uh, work group asked, do patients need to refrain from getting in surgical incision wet? And they overwhelmingly said yes, they should refrain for the first two hours after surgery. Um, but with an occlusive dressing, they could shower. And so that brings us to occlusive dressings. We see in the plastic surgery literature, they have improved rates of re-epithelialization, increased collagen synthesis by up to six times, and a lower rate of wound uh, infection. Now that's just in the, uh, the plastic surgery literature. My occlusive dressing of choice for my go-to is the Aquacel dressing. It's a good barrier. It's got uh, antimicrobial effects of silver. Uh, they say you can leave it up to seven days. I leave mine up to 14 days because I usually check my patients at two weeks. Um, and patients tend to be very satisfied, especially with the ability to shower right away and not have to do a bunch of painful dressing changes all the time. This is what it looks like. The outer portion is a hydrocolloid. That's basically, it is duoderm, which we know is great on decubitus ulcers. And inside there's a hydrofiber, this kind of um, cellulose uh, type of compound, which does a great job of absorbing uh, the fluid. And uh, this is what it looks like. So it allows you to absorb the fluid um, and still maintain a hydrated environment without causing mass maceration uh, around the incision. And when it locks in the fluid, it sequesters bacteria and traps any potential harmful enzymes. It's got a broad rate of antibacterial activity. And uh, this is what it looks like. And this chart, this uh, electron micrograph, just like in communism, red means dead. So this, you stick around for about 60 minutes and you see all of those Pseudomonas bacteria have gone from green to red just from this uh, hydrofiber alone. So here's some of the clinical evidence supporting the Sharkey and Parvizi out of the Rothman Institute, looked at 1,700 patients and found a four-fold reduction in surgical site infection of total knees. Ortho Carolina found great patient satisfaction and reduced blistering. And Columbia Prez, a non-industry sponsored study, went to look at this and see if they could reproduce the Rothman Institute findings, and they did with another four-fold reduction in surgical site infections. This is specifically a, a PubMed review looking at hydrofiber, where they also found a fourfold reduction in SSI with hydrofiber addressings. So uh, their consensus, so they, they, they did, this work group did agree that occlusive and or silver impregnated dressings have been proven to reduce the overall rate of wound complications in joint replacement surgery and should be considered for routine use. And most of those studies were the Aquacel studies that they used. What is the optimal dressing? They also recommended the use of occlusive dressings and, uh, of hydrofiber, but that consensus was uh, a little more weak. And that brings us to the next step, negative pressure wound therapy. We know that uh, wound vacs are great for open wounds, but uh, what about with closed incisions? And we're starting to use them more. How do they work? Um, it's not exactly like you think. There's direct effect which consists of macro deformation, where you're actually, the foam is squeezing and actually contracting and making a smaller surface area of your wound. It's inducing uh, capillary compression. And paradoxically, that decreased oxygen content um, and tension from capillary compression stimulates things like vascular endothelial growth factor to promote neovascularization. On a micro level, there's cytoskeletal stretch, which induces cel uh, cellular proliferation. A stabilization both mechanically and environmentally. So mechanically, just like with the skin grafts, you know when we skin grafted before in the old days and you do the cotton and the bolster and it would shear, you get that wound back on there, you're not shearing that skin graft. Well, the similar concept with the incision, a closed incision itself, as well as maintaining a stable environment, you don't have a lot of uh, outside factors and changes in concentrations of different things around that incision. It also allows for fluid removal, which improves that interface connection and decreases the tension at that site, and, and that gives you the indirect effects of modulation of inflammation, angiogenesis, granulation tissue, peripheral nerve response, and decreased bio burden. So here's the literature, there's a lot of it. Most of it regards high risk cases, and as we talked about before, Cooper and uh, Rodriguez did indeed do the, uh, the study uh, looking at direct anteriors where they did find a decreased rate of surgical infection um, in high risk cases when using negative pressure. The other, um, the other study was done by Lee Rubin, found no difference in normal or high-risk cases. So the consensus, the consensus on these dressings is to uh, not use them in regular cases, but to use them in high-risk cases, and uh, also strategy for draining wound after surgery. They are an optimal uh, uh, method to, to uh, give that local wound care when you have a draining incision in the early period. So not recommended for routine use, prophylactic for high-risk, and a therapeutic for early post-op drainage in terms of uh, using negative pressure dressings. 
these, when you say what is a high risk case, these are the things that they listed as high risk cases in terms of the work group. And even though we try to avoid in these cases, um, certainly there's times where these people have to have surgery. So this is the one, my go-to, this is the Avell dressing. Uh, it still uses the hydrofiber, uh, the hydrofiber in the center that touches the incision as well as the silicone border, which is a good adhesive yet still very kind to the skin. Uh, it's very lightweight, it's got a flat, uh, a flat tubing that doesn't compress the skin and it's protected. It comes in about half, you wonder how, what's the difference between this and, and Pico or Provena. It's about half the price of the Provena on average and about 20% less than the Pico. Uh, it's, it tends to be lighter. It's got a nice little belt clip for the patient and very well tolerated. Um, so here's some of my case examples. This is a patient, 46-year-old male, with a female with cholangiocarcinoma, the femoral head. And she's high risk because she has previous uh, pelvic radiation therapy and is on chemotherapy. So that, this one would be an ideal one for negative pressure dressing. Here we are getting ready for cement. That's a relatively straight shafted uh, reamer. Here's our uh, intraoperative x-rays. Uh, for those of you who want to join me on the dark side, I do the tableless approach. And with this approach, I can put a flat plate under the table and uh, bring in rad link from the top. So these are, you see here are full length, uh, full intraoperative pelvic x-rays flat during direct anterior. I like to do a femoral neck napkin ring because you can really injure the TFL coming out with a large femoral head. And same thing, preserving that capsule, this kind of incision. So here we are afterwards. But this is us putting on the dressing. I, try, I prefer to put all my dressings on sterilely, of course, um, putting on sterile in the OR and keeping it on until I see them in clinic in 10 to 14 days. So it's a nice, kind silver hydrocolloid. Um, and it uh, sticks very well, but doesn't cause blisters. Here we are 12 days postoperatively where things are nice and calm. There's not a lot of big swelling and bruising and uh, everything looks, looks happy. Here we have another case, a Russian female with oral carcinoma on chemotherapy, our intraoperative pictures. And here we are, and that's us closing, but you can see in the background, that's the rad link shot where we're getting a full length, uh, full pelvis x-ray going in. And this is what a soft tissues look like and eight days post-op. So same thing, 29-year-old male with ankylosing spondylitis, getting good cup position with the rad link, direct anterior, and there's our incision. Uh, restarting the DMARDs about four weeks after surgery. Here he is, 12 days. So this is important, I brought this from the uh, ICL. This is our uh, Medicare fee schedule since the 1990s. We're dropping 66%, that's showing no signs of stopping. Um, all the while inflation is going through the roof. This is a, a big problem. So I, I'm not big on in inclusivity and equity, but I am big on diversity when it comes to being smart. The more that we do our job and do good things and get really good at, at joint replacement surgery and do nothing else, the more uh, we can get taken advantage of. Why, do they, why can they drop the price like this? A simple macroeconomic question, because they can. The second we start saying no, you'll see that curve reverse, but we can only say no if we know how to do other things. So I'll just present a quick uh, case on a uh, patient with renal cell carcinoma. See a big uh, renal mass, a big acetabular mass. On this one, we need a preoperative embolization. Went ahead and fixed and stabilized the socket. He did well. Uh, people with renal cell can live a long time. A year later, he developed more pain. Wasn't his hip. This time, it's his, it's his sacrum. These surgeries to do a sacrectomy pretty much have a 100% wound complication rate in the literature. I told him to expect it. You can see that's his exposed rectum there after we dissected the tumor off. Here's what the tumor looks like on the side table. And here we are closed. Kept those full thickness flaps, same principles as we talked about on the hip replacement. And then here we are with the hydrofiber dressing. And then you see at 15 days both stop. I told him to expect a wound problem. I said we pretty much should schedule a surgery for a washout in two weeks and uh, begged him to stay off of it, and luckily, this is what we've got. And so I think in large part to this uh, negative pressure dressing, which was really key to prevent contamination and uh, keep the tension down and keep that wound nice and happy. So in summary, PGI remains a significant cause of morbidity and mortality. Soft tissue compromise and contamination remains a major risk factor for infection. The international consensus gave us some good guidelines. Meticulous attention to the soft tissues and the preoperative the operative and the post-operative phases is essential to minimize the risk of infection. Significant evidence exists to suggest that occlusive surgical dressings decrease the rate of infection, and negative pressure dressings uh, may really help with high-risk wounds and with post-operative drainage. Thank you.